The Boston Celtics make it four straight wins. They defeat the Sixers, tie their season series up at one apiece. We're going to dive into it on today's episode of Green with Envy. Jason Tatum led all scorers last night with 29 points, also had eight rebounds and six assists, really indicating that he's rising up there when it comes to assist numbers. Um, Derek White had a phenomenal night. He had 27 points on just 12 field goal attempts. Um, Drew Holiday had 18 points, 10 of which came in the first quarter when the Celtics took an early double-digit lead. And Al Horford, in, in my eyes, stole the show in a lot of ways, finishing with 14 points, three assists, eight rebounds, and five blocks. Um, by far his season high, and, and several of which were on Embiid. Um, so those were the Celtics' top performers. They also got a little bit of contributions from Sam Hauser, who had eight. Um, and they were without Chris Alps, Porzingis, and Jalen Brown, but really didn't miss a beat throughout the night. So if anybody new here, um, Noah is joining us as a guest. For the usual people, this is Noah. Noah's a, a new contributor at Celtics Blog. She's absolutely crushing it, uh, doing some work over for the WNBA side of SB Nation as well. Noah, do you just want to introduce yourself, give everyone a rundown, and please pronounce your, your last name so I don't butcher it for the rest yeah. of the show? Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Adam. Uh, yeah, my name is Noah Dalzell. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, my name is Noah Dalzell, and I am a new writer uh, covering the Celtics, started over the summer. Um, lifelong Celtics fan, live in Boston, have also played basketball my whole life. My dad played professional basketball overseas for 20 years. So that's kind of how I got into all of this, into this, you know, basketball world um, and have been writing all of my life, but have never really combined my passion for basketball and writing. And um, yeah, it's been really awesome getting involved with Celtics blog and, and beginning, beginning to cover the team and attend games and kind of get to know the landscape a little bit better. So you hit the ground running, right? Like some of your first pieces, you sourced quotes from coaches you kind of really threw yourself in head first. To me, I, I mean, I've said this on Twitter. I think you're one of like the best new people on the scene type of thing. You know, every year I, see, I feel like people drop off. They've been chasing the dream for a while. They drop, new people take their place. And you've just been crushing it. So did you have them connections when you came into the, like writing about basketball through playing basketball yourself? Or was you just reaching out to people? Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, no, I kind of got lucky, honestly. I realized over the summer, um, I'd been attending a lot of playoff games and it was costing a lot of money. So that was part of my thinking was, you know, is there a way that I can start getting a little bit more involved and, um, you know, be a little more productive about this passion that I have than just watching and, and talking about it. Um, and so, yeah, I saw that Celtics blog was hiring for, you know, paid writers, like pretty much right the week that I decided I wanted to do this. It was like very serendipitous, the timing. Um, and just applied for one of the roles. And um, yeah, everyone's been so helpful. Everyone's been so welcoming and thoughtful and, and you know, helping get connected with folks. And so, yeah, kind of just, I think, really got lucky. And, and you know, I think Celtics Blog is a great, great place to start for as far as just getting to know people in this space. Um, I did, I have gotten one interview through my dad. It was a, uh, Peyton Pritchard's college coach was his college teammate when they played basketball in New Mexico. So um, that was helpful. That was a good one. That's crazy. So who, what teams did your dad play for? We will get in for anyone listening. We are going to talk six yeah. Celtics. Don't worry. Yeah. Um, so he played at Eastern New Mexico in college and then he played um, in Israel at Maccabi, Tel uh, Maccabi, sorry, Apollo Tel Aviv. Those are rivals. So I should not have gotten that wrong. Um, and several other teams in Israel. So he's American, but just kind of landed there. Um, and yeah, that's where he, ha he played his entire career. So for Celtics fans, you've got Yamada was over in Israel. If you want to go yeah. back and look at rivals, you had Amari Stadamai was over there for a hot minute. Um, I think PJ Tucker spent some time in Israel at the start of his season. I may be wrong there, but I feel like I'm... Um, Nate yeah. Robinson. I think Nate Robinson played for uh, Hapoel, which is my dad's team. See, that's wild. That's yeah, wild. I, okay, I need to speak to you there because he can teach me more <laughs> about basketball. Uh, coming into this game, so going over to the Celtic Sixers, the Celtics without Jalen Brown, the Celtics without Chris Stapps, Paul Zingas. Two of their top three guys are out. Derek White steps up in a big way. Al Horford steps up in a big way. Drew Holiday has his moments where he kind of takes over for a minute, but then figures out how to get everybody back involved. Coming into the game, before you saw anything that happened, what was what was you looking for? What was some of your big kind of like, they need to nail the X to be able to even stand a chance? Yeah, I mean, I think they're such a deep team that they can really afford 
to have a couple guys out from their starting lineup. Like it's really a luxury, the depth that they have in that top six. And so wasn't overly concerned with them being down. Przingis and Brown was more kind of like intrigued of like, who's going to get these extra shots? How is it going to look with, you know, slightly different rotations? Um, and I thought they looked great for the most part. I mean, it was a tough second quarter, but for the most part, I thought they looked great. Um, and was, it was, I was actually really curious about how Al Horford was going to play because I feel like every time he plays the 76ers, he turns back the clock. Um, and I usually try to pre-write a little bit of my articles and I, I pre-wrote like an entire opening section about how Al Horford like really played great defense and you know, all these things. And I was like, I'm just going to put this out there and see if that, that happens. And as the game was turning out, I was like, this is exactly what I was anticipating. He's got this thing right where he's struggled all season coming off the bench. I think that yeah. Chris Paul spoke about this when he first started coming off the bench for the Warriors. There's a huge like shift in how you prepare pre-game. Your warm-up's completely different because it's more sustained to keep you warm longer rather than going straight into physical activity. You need to just be more well-stretched. And Horford's one of these guys that does feel like a rhythm shooter. A lot of his impact doesn't show up in the box score. And as much as we try not to, I feel like role players are judged, especially bench role players, more out of that box score than what people in the starting unit are. So for him to come in and kind of just remind everybody, like, yo, I'm not washed. I can right. still I can still cook. I, like, I can still lock Embiid up five blocks. I will say I think the two blocks he got on Embiid were strips more than blocks. Both were yeah. on the way up. It wasn't really a swat. But he, he balled out. He really, really did. And obviously after the game, um, he spoke. Was you at the game? No, no. no you didn't travel to Philadelphia. No. No, nobody did. I was just being a bit funny. Um, I think, I think the, that Jack at Celtics blog might have actually. I haven't asked him. Usually, he just does home games. Yeah, he was live tweeting the the press conferences, so I thought he. I think he might have been there. I'm very jealous. Philadelphia is not far from Boston. It's yeah. very far from Adam. Um, but no, just for the way he was kind of sp- saying, like he likes playing in the city. He likes the fact that he gets the trash talk that he gets in Philadelphia. I don't understand why they hate him so much. It didn't work out. He went back, you know what I mean? But this was a really big game for him. Who else was you kind of impressed with? So we had a Delano Banton sighting. Um, Wasn't great. Wasn't awful. Gave you some hustle. Didn't really do much. But then we have Derek White that kind of be like steps up. I feel like he, he went away for the birth of his child, come back, and it took a game or two for the rhythm to come back. Yeah. And this was a really good game from D. White. So when you're looking at the the partnership between Derek White and Drew Holiday, what were you kind of hoping for knowing that your two other top guys in Brown and Porzingis are out? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a really exciting opportunity because Derek White and Drew Holiday are both guys that I think could get 25 on a, on a given night and could run the offense through them. And a lot of times they're, they take a backseat to some of the stars. You know, I think Brown and, and Porzingis are the second and third leading scorers on the team right now. But certainly Drew Holiday and Derek White could be taking more shots and getting more opportunities. And um, it's not even, I mean, he took 12 shots last night. That's a really efficient 27 points, but um, much of the fourth quarter and really at like critical moments, it seemed like he was very much calm, collected and ready to, you know, run the pick and roll, which he's become so good at. Um, and so, yeah, it didn't surprise me because I think that, you know, he had struggled for a few games, but for the most part has been really efficient this season and really has been for, you know, starting mid last season. And so um, he looked great and, and Drew Holiday came out swinging in the first quarter. He had turned 10 first quarter points and Missoula had said after the game, you know, I told him, I, you know, I've seen you take over these games when the, when the Bucks were down, you know, key players. I think he scored 50 once last year when Giannis was out a game. Or actually, I think Giannis actually played that game. But he's he definitely has shown the potential to take over an offense. And he that just hasn't been his role on this team yet. He's been rebounding. I think he's been rebounding more than ever before. He's been playing incredible defense on, on guards and, and post players alike. Um, but I think he came out early in that quarter to kind of assert, assert the fact that he was going to be able to contribute – uh, offensively as well um, and then I thought Luke Cornett also provided some huge minutes he gets so much hate right like um, <laughs> about a week ago I remember scrolling through Instagram and I saw somebody had posted Luke Cornett the worst player in the NBA and I'm like do you understand how wild of a like yeah. an accusation that is to be the worst guy in the NBA like the worst guy in the NBA doesn't get minutes period and he's um, probably not on the Celtics. <laughs> no, I think there's a lot of people that feel like Bones Highland might end up there. Like he's just been told he's not getting minutes for the Clippers for the foreseeable future. Like, you know, I like Bones Highland. I just want to throw some strays at other people to save Cornet. Um, I think he had a good game. Like, 
the thing with Luke is, I, I don't know if you agree, he's got more Al Horford in him than Chris Stapps Porzingis in him. Yeah. It's very much a non box score impact. It, I like the Cornet contest. I understand the logic. You take away the, the line of sight to the rim. Now guys don't really know where they're shooting the ball. They're just shooting it in the direction. And if it goes in, then great. For me, I think one of the other performers that I liked, and I've been defending him and criticizing him all season, was Pritchard. I think that Pritchard's movement off the ball is improving this year. Mm. Like um, Coming into the season, he's a very ball-dominant guy, right? Like If the ball's not in his hands, he's not doing much. Against Philly, he did a lot of uh, cutting. He did a lot of kind of small screening. Just making some impact there. But the most important thing was for me was how they kept Embiid away from the paint for the majority of the game. Like There was possessions where Embiid was in the corner. And you're like, why are you putting the best big in the league or second best if you want because of Jokic so far away from where he's the most effective. Like you don't really want Embiid shooting corner freeze and you don't want him trying to drive towards the rim. You want him catching the ball in that mid post and going to work there. So what I'm trying to ask you is how would you feeling about how the Celtics guarded Embiid? I, I don't think there's a team that guards Embiid better. I mean, I, you know, we saw a little bit of Drew Holiday on him, particularly in the first game. And then Al Horford really was, primarily responsible for him for much of last night's game. Um, but, I mean, he got four free throw attempts, which is – I think he's averaging something like 10 a game. So that's, you know, far below that season average. He finished with 20 points, which is also his season low. So both of those were season lows. Um, and then I think he took, like, one or two shots the entire fourth quarter. I mean, he got that, that put-back dunk that was meaningless, you know, at the buzzer. But he he just wasn't – it's not even like, you know, he's he's forcing things or he's still trying to make it work. Like it almost like he mentally gets taken out um, when the Celtics defensive scheme is kind of pushing him out of you know the spots that he wants. Al Horford knows and has studied his every move more than probably any other player in the league's history. Um, and so to me, it's like he just takes himself out at a certain point. Like I was, you know, I was really looking through like the play by play in the fourth quarter this morning. And I was thinking, like, it's not like he was like throwing up bricks. Like he just stopped being aggressive, um, which is obviously great for the Celtics, you know, that that he's just kind of taking himself out at a certain point when he's not feeling comfortable anymore. Um, and so it, it definitely seems like Tyrese Maxey's more of the closer on that team now. Um, and he had a couple of, you know, aggressive, aggressive you know, drives in the fourth and has just been like a, a great fourth quarter player for them. Um, but yeah, I mean, Embiid, he just didn't look super comfortable. And, and that's all you can really, can really ask for with a great player like that. I always, have you watched He Got Game? The, okay. Have you watched the movie He Got Game? No, I haven't. Okay, first of all, you need to watch that movie. That movie is iconic. Um, th that's something you need to do this weekend. It's honestly... Okay, I can do it. <laughs> it's the movie that got me into basketball. It's uh, Ray Allen, Denzel Washington. Okay. Um, Spike Lee directed it. It's a big-time, big-time movie. But one of the um, the quotes from there is, you're not going to be able to stop him. All you can do is try to contain him. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the way I look at all st like top 15, top 20 guys in the NBA. It's not how did you stop him, it's how did you contain him. If you keep Jason Tatum at 22 points, 8 rebounds, 5 assists, you contained him. He didn't go off, do you know what I mean? Uh, it was kind of the same for Embiid, but you did mention Maxi, who to me is not only a guaranteed all-star if he keeps playing this way, he's probably the most improved candidate. Yeah. Probably, you know, the Sixers don't need to go and find that second star next to Embiid because Max is developing into that. After the Celtics played the Sixers in their first game where Philadelphia won, one of my biggest takeaways was like, you need to find an answer for Maxi now because this is a matchup that's going to cook you for the next three regular season games or four regular season, how many games are in the in-season, like little schedule between these two guys. And then it's pretty much a given they're going to see each other in the postseason, depending on how seeding falls. Yeah. So figuring out how to stop Maxi early, to me, was like really important. And I felt like Boston did a much better job of containing Maxi in this game than what they did in game one, where he kind of just controlled the tempo of the game. Yeah, definitely. I mean, he's definitely, he's a guy that controls the tempo of the game. That's like, you know, I think that's definitely his thing, but um, there's no, there's no backcourt that's better equipped to guard someone like him than the Celtics, you know, between Drew Holiday and Derek White, um, they both, they both can, can switch. They can, you know, prevent a lot, a lot of ha from happening. I think the couple of times where he got free was he had like a, you know, with Cornette on him, just gave him way too much space. And he had a, a really clean look at a three that happened a couple of times where, you know, he just got, he got the matchup that he wanted and was able to exploit that. But uh, a big thing with him is just like keeping him out of, you know, transition and, and 
you know, when he's going downhill, it's like pretty much impossible to stop. There's very few players in the league just from an eye test that look as as effective as him in, in that in those types of situations. So, you know, he finished six of fifteen. Um, that's exactly what you were talking about containing people. I think that's that's all you could hope for with someone like that. Um, and he he definitely you know he had some some big ones down the stretch, but um, for the most part he wasn't anywhere near the player that we saw last week. Nor is he the, was he the player that scored fifty on Indiana. I think he struggled a little bit uh, last night as well. So you know I think sometimes you you have your breakthrough fifty point game uh, and then it's you go back down to earth a little bit too. So there's probably a little bit of that as well. Um, but yeah, I thought they were pretty effective on him. Um, he's he's gonna continue to be great for Philadelphia, and I'm sure if you know the Celtics do face off in in, in the playoffs. Um, I could see him being a little bit of a problem, but that's you know that's why you go go out and get Drew Holiday this summer and get Derek White. You know you know you have the guys for it, so it's all about just kind of the attention to detail, the schemes. But um, there's no reason why the Celtics shouldn't be able to really pay attention to him, especially because right now there's not you know they were out of you know no Kelly Oubre last night, no Nick Batum, so they they wore out a few of their kind of self creators. Um, so you can kind of really pay attention to someone like him. I saw a Sixers fan earlier. Uh, I think I quote tweeted him saying that we didn't have Ubre, we didn't have Batum. Celtics fans don't do a di- victory lap. I was like, dude, the Celtics didn't have two All Stars. They, they deserve a victory lap. Just for reference, this is the movie. Please, please, please watch the movie. I'll watch it this weekend. I have time. It's it's old as shit. It's like early nineteen nineties. It was okay. before. I think it was before Ray Allen was even like an All Star. Like, but it's definitely worth a watch. Um. Carrying on, sorry, I, I tend to kind of lose track when I start talking about movies and stuff. So we've looked at the way the Sixers were. We've looked at some of the, the Celtics. One question I had was coming into the season, the fan base was split. Were they deep enough Did or were they going to struggle once they had to go deeper than their, their seven ma- seventh man? Right, You knew that you had your top six. Then there'd probably be one guy. Maybe it's Svi. Maybe it's whoever that you're probably going to be confident enough to trust, most likely Luke Corner in that in this instance. But once you get deeper than that, there was a lot of concern about the drop-off. Me, personally, I'm not an O'Shea Brissett guy. I'm not really a fan of single-skill guys in any aspect. If you're only a shooter, I think that your value is very limited. If you're a defensive specialist that doesn't score consistently, your value is very limited. And this, the, the back end of the Celtics bench is pretty much like that, right? You've got... Uh, Brissett and Stevens as your defensive guys can't do shit on offense. You've got um, Svi that can't do shit on defense. You start being like, how are you going to cope when you're forced into a bigger role? And then we come into this game and Banton's in a bigger role. Svi's in a bigger role. So how did your concerns from the start of the season with the depth kind of show up or not show up in this game where Boston had to actually go deeper into the bench? Yeah, so first of all, I think... I always think those concerns are premature as far as depth um, because you, we just don't know. Like you go out there and you acquire all these new guys and yeah, there, you know, there's film on them. Yeah. There's some, some NBA experience and staff to go off of. Um, but it's so hard to predict like who's going to be able to step up into that role. And every year those guys that surprise um, and are able to kind of like, you know, who, who would have seen Sam Hauser coming, you know? And, and so that's why I always say like, you have to wait like at least a uh, you know, quarter of the season before you can start to make really you know, big sweeping generaliz- generalizations about the bench. Um, that being said, you mentioned the top six. I think it's fair to say we have a top seven now. I think Sam Hauser has really asserted himself as like a very reliable rotation player. Um, he struggled a little bit from three last night. He finished two for eight. So below, I think he was something like 45% on the season before that and particularly really hot as of late. Um, but he's just a really solid all around player now. Like he plays really good defense. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's, it's totally under an, an underrated part of his game. And, you know, Missoula joked about it the other night. He said, like, I'm not going to say why he, why he, people think he can't play defense, but, um, you know, he, he, if you, if you just watch him and sometimes I'll just watch him for like, when I'm watching the game, I'll just only watch him on defense for like a 10 minute stretch. And he's just, he's, he can move his feet really well. He really knows what he's doing. Um, you know, he had a couple of, a couple of like not so great defensive plays last night, but for the most part, he really holds his own. And then he, he's just shown, been shown to be one of the the NBA sharpshooters. And so, and he's hit some big ones, you know, he hasn't gotten a lot of playoff run, but I would say that he's really asserted himself as like the that seventh guy. Um, Pritchard obviously will be a lot more of a threat if he can score a little bit more efficiently, but I think he can be that eighth guy. And then the, the rest of the group, I mean, we got some good band in minutes. I think Cornette is is limited in what he can do. And a couple of times, sometimes he gets kind of pushed around or, or little things happen where it's like, I, he just doesn't look, I think somebody just doesn't, doesn't look the part and that's where he, some of the, some of the criticism comes from, but he had two big putbacks in the fourth quarter. 
Um, he battles with the best the, you know, post players that are out there. Like he really can take that matchup. Um, and he just really knows the system. That's good picks plays, you know, just plays really within himself. Um, good lob threat. So I think he's a guy that I've been excited to watch, you know, develop over the last few years, but really that, that threesome of, you know, Hauser, Pritchard and Cornette, those are all guys that are now familiar with the system. They're familiar with one another. I mean, when Pritchard and Hauser are out there, Pritchard's just looking for Hauser and setting him up for like, it's like a sh- three point shooter's dream, you know, the way that he sets him up. So those three are the guys that I think I'm the most confident in just because of their experience now playing within the Celtics offense and defense. Um, and then, you know, Svi and Banton are kind of like question marks. I, I'm curious. I would like to see more of them before I would say anything more sweeping. But, I mean, Svi is a great shooter. I think just like I, I don't see what he brings to the table over Sam. So that's kind of the main question. It's almost like he's like Sam insurance or something like that at this point or just kind of another body to throw out there. But um, I do – I always watch him in warm-ups when I go to the games and he like literally doesn't miss. So um, that's when you can tell who the great shooters are. I think the people that just like literally don't miss during warm-ups. Um, so yeah, I'm 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 not I feel fine about the Celtics bench, honestly. Like I think it can be, you know, especially when you go to the playoffs, you know, you're only doing an eight-man rotation anyways. I think they have a solid eight-man rotation, but time will tell, you know, if they if they go through more stretches where like they just literally can't score, um, then Brad will probably do something about that. It's not going to happen, just so everybody listening understands that what I'm saying now is more joking than serious. But if you could swap Luke Cornett for Daniel Tice, would you? Uh, probably, but I think he's already, he's already with LA, right? I think that pretty much confirmed. Um, yeah, was, uh, it's an open secret. Yeah. I mean, I honestly, I loved watching FIBA this summer. That was like my, my NBA off season obsession and just watching him play. And I know FIBA is different. I know it's, there's a lot of you know differences in the, in the game style and everything, but I was like, damn, we have to get him back. Um, he looked great. So, um, I would say probably, but also I think there's so much about continuity. Like right now you have a good thing going, you have a good group of guys, I think Cornette's like huge to the locker room. Like I think everyone wants to go in the trade machine and like make all these changes. But right now you have a good thing. Like there's not you don't want to ship out like core guys midseason um, if you don't have to. That's my my take on it at least. No, I'm exactly the same. I really like Daniel Tice, but you haven't had as much success with him as what you probably would have liked. He's a great third big, and I feel like he probably does give you a little bit more than Luke Cornette does. But the Celtics are built around being so, uh, that like long, tall, right. really rangy, and you'd be losing some of that with Tice. It doesn't really fit the way this roster has been constructed overall. But it's definitely a question worth asking because he got waived yesterday. He hasn't cleared waivers yet. So technically, I don't think he's with the Clippers unless I missed that update overnight. Um, but he's going there. That's where he's going. And they'll still be bad with or without Daniel Tice. So we don't need to worry about what LA are doing. With that being said, I think that you know we've touched on the game, we've touched on some over like bigger picture thoughts as well. So just to wrap up, I just want you to, if you're okay with it, let everybody know where they can find you, anything you're working on, anything you've done that you're really proud of. Just take this minute just to promote the hell out of anything you want. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, you can find me on Twitter, uh, Noah Dalzell NBA. That's where I post uh, all my new articles and things like that. Um, as far as things I'm proud of, I've written a couple of long form articles that I've, I've liked more though. I think my, my pinned tweet is an article about Keda, um, that was able to kind of go back and look at his, his journey. And he, he became a fan favorite in preseason. We'll see if we see more of him. Um, but that was fun to write. And then also wrote a piece about domestic violence that I was proud of and kind of how we, the NBA needs to do a lot more in that regard. Um, but yeah, many more, many more pieces to come. So yeah, if you can follow me on Twitter, no, it does all NBA. That's where I'll be posting all my content moving forward. I'll also, if you send me those links, I'll post them in the podcast description hyperlink for people and I'll post them on YouTube and wherever you're watching this, there'll be links that you can click on so you can go and explore Noah's work, get to know the way she writes, the the way she's viewing the game. And then I'll also link your socials as well. So make sure you go and show Noah some love. Everybody will be back with a bigger episode. You know, these recaps are short. Tomorrow, I think Will's back. So it'll be me and Will or me, Will and Greg. It'll be some of us. Henry won't be in the room at that point if you can hear the snoring because he doesn't shut up. (laughs) And Bulldogs, man, they're just asleep all day. And we'll be back uh, tomorrow. Everybody have a great day. Noah, thank you very much again. Thanks so much. Have a good one.